Nigeria's federal government has continued to initiate, design, and implement measures to contain the coronavirus pandemic. These include policies to ameliorate the COVID-19. Minister for Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Haji Asadia Umar Farouk, announced that Nigerians with 5,000 Naira or less in their bank accounts will form the basis of the conditional cash transfer. In addition to the existing National Social Register, the ministry says it will use bank verification numbers, BVNs, and previous record of purchase of recharge card of at least 100 Naira by mobile phone owners as criteria to identify beneficiaries of the cash transfer. In the face of all these explanations, the leadership of the National Assembly are demanding for reforms of the distribution of the palliatives. How is the data of the National Social Register generated? How reliable and effective are the records of the purchase of Richard cards by Nigerians? And are the BVNs reliable? These and more are the issues that we will examine in this edition of Platform with the Honorable Minister, Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Hajia Sadia Omar Farouk. Honorable Minister, welcome to Platform. Thank you very much. Honorable Mr. Uh, because of the social distance uh, and necessity, we're having only one panelist and myself. Ruth Aguele is the assistant producer of this program and at the same time, the uh, only panelist that uh, <laughs> will be asking the questions along with myself. Uh, once again, Honorable Minister, thank you for joining us in the studio on this special edition of our platform to look at the challenges of the distribution of palliatives across the country. Uh, it is a very huge task, no doubt. How has it been? Well, uh, as you said, it is very challenging, but at the same time, um, we are committed uh, to the cost of uh, delivering uh, these services to uh, Nigerians. And uh, we're trying our best to see that nobody is left uh, behind. Okay, and um, since you're talking about nobody being left behind, um, for you, you know, taking up this challenge, you know, going from state to state, what's uh, some of the experiences you've um, noticed concerning um, the beneficiaries and also from the, your interactions with some of the state governors where you go to distribute some of these palliatives? Uh, well, uh, I will say that, uh, let me start with the state governments. The state uh, governors are cooperating with us. Uh, they are also playing their own roles to see that the targeted beneficiaries are identified and these uh, palliatives reach to them. Uh, for on the side of the beneficiaries, they look up to us and they are very uh, happy that we have uh, lived up to our responsibility by going there ourselves uh, to flag up these programs and to assure them that uh, this program uh, is geared towards uh, cushioning the effect uh, really of this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic that is uh, bedeviling us as a nation. So it is a, a story of um, uh, people have been appreciative of what government is doing to them and also uh, we are getting the cooperation that we require from the uh, stakeholders. Well, if you are getting the cooperation required from the stakeholders, let's go back to the basics. In my introduction, we talked about the uh, the need, uh, your reliance substantially on the National Social Register. How is it that register generated and how effective do you think it will be or it, it has been? Uh, well, let me start by saying that this is a program that has been in existence since 2016. Uh, the Conditional Cash Transfer uh, Program is a program targeted at poor and vulnerable households in our society. And the way these uh, uh, beneficiaries are identified is through the community engagement. Uh, members of the community come together. Uh, the leaders uh, and the traditional rulers in that community come together to identify who really are poor and vulnerable in that community. 
and it is based on that uh, that these uh, uh, beneficiaries are captured and they are put into the data. So it is uh, a community engagement uh, approach, uh, so to speak. And as I'm talking to you, we have 2.6 million uh, poor and vulnerable households in the National Social Register. And once you are in the register, then you will be enrolled into the, uh, uh, the beneficiary, National Social Beneficiary Register. That also goes through a, a process. So this is a program that has gone through this process and we have uh, beneficiaries on board. But with the coming of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we are directed by Mr. President to give a two months advance payment to these poor and vulnerable households. Mm -hmm. uh, in the program, we give them 5,000 Naira per month and we pay them two months, 10,000. So with this directive, we now pay 20,000 Naira uh, per month to these, to these uh, beneficiaries. We've just uh, uh, started the February, March, April uh, uh, um, disbursement. And by next month, we'll start the May, June uh, disbursement. That is, that is how it is uh, being carried out. In the last broadcast of Mr. President, he also directed that we expand the, the scope of the beneficiaries. And that is where we are seeing, we are going to look at uh, this uh, issue very critically. Mm. And uh, our focus will be really on the urban poor, uh, people that live on um, daily uh, uh, earning uh, for their livelihood and people living with disabilities as well as uh, other vulnerable uh, groups and that's why we will come up with these uh, options of using the BVN of the bank accounts of these uh, uh, groups that do not have more than 5,000 Naira in their accounts and then the mobile uh, phones those that uh, recharge their phones from 100 Naira and below Okay. Uh, monthly and then also the ones that we have uh, in the register already waiting uh, for uh, enrollment into the beneficiary. That, that is the crux of the matter yes. because this urban poor are spread all over and persons with disabilities are spread all over. What manner of collaboration does your ministry have with the banks that will warrant you, your, you, you, if the effectiveness of this distribution, if at all it will be? Well, we are collaborating with the uh, Ministry of Finance through the CBN and then the uh, NIPS to get the data of this uh, uh, group of uh, individuals uh, that have this, uh, that fall within this criteria. And we are also working with the Ministry of Communications uh, through the NCC to also get uh, the data of all the um, teleco companies that have uh, people that recharge, uh, you know, their their phones with the hundred naira and below. We have held a meeting with them earlier this week, and I'm expecting to report back uh, to the uh, presidency on the outcomes of our meeting with them and what we've been able to get uh, from these organizations. Okay, and since the president has already stated that 1 million people will be added to the 2.6 uh, million um, beneficiaries, now if you're going to digitalize this process of payments, uh, is it going to start with this 1 million people or are you going to expand the scope? Um, um, also, um, how many states so far have benefited from the CCT? Well, for the purpose of this COVID-19, I think that's why Mr. President, in his uh, wisdom, says directed that we, we expand the beneficiaries. So that's why I mentioned we are focusing on the urban poor that might not necessarily be in the register. Okay. So what we have in the register is going to be there. 
uh, that the two point six million. Is, yeah, the two point six million, mm. and they are not all uh, enrolled as beneficiaries. They are in the register. It's from that register that we move them to the beneficiary register. Okay. What we have currently is one million people that we are paying. Okay. But we have uh, another uh, balance in the in the national social register. But for the purpose of this uh, situation that we are in. That's why we are using the BVM, we are using the, the, the uh, t mobile uh, phones, as well as uh, using some of the people that fall within this criteria that we already have in the social register that we can move them to do. And before now, we have also had discussions with the um, social protection donor group of the UN, and they have agreed for us to also expand and the rapid uh, registration for the COVID-19 uh, response by one million uh, beneficiaries. So that while that is going on, we also have this directive that we're also Maybe you need to explain this. Social Protection Group, what, Social what are they Social Protection uh, Donor Group of the donor UN. Group. Okay. Of the United been, Nations. Of the United Nations that has been shared by the World Bank. Mm. Uh, it is a World Bank funded program anyway. It is mm. this uh, conditional cash transfer. So we have uh, had uh, discussions with them, and we have gotten approval to expand okay. by okay. another one million. In this case, we are going to get the ones that we already have in the register that are, have not benefited for them to be moved out of the two point six, out of the two point six okay. to be moved into the beneficiary register. Now we are going to have two million people. But does it go to does it cut across all states? It because there are agitations. It really, it cuts across all states. Well, the issue is, you know, because of the processes involved. Uh, if we are going to the state, we notify the state government. And uh, there are certain uh, commitments that state governments are also supposed to make, especially in the area of um, training uh, the people that we are going to take to the field to get this data for us. Okay. And they are supposed to be in, in terms of six in number. But if a government uh, decides to, to do it as fast as possible, they can increase the team by funding that team in the training as well as in the, in the logistics uh, involved. So that is why you see in the register, some states are higher than others. And we're supposed to start with 30% of all the local governments in the state. It's when you are able to saturate that 30% that we go back uh, for another 70%. But some states uh, were not really uh, committed to the program up initial. And so that's why you see the the this, this disparities, disparities in, in, in the figures uh, across the states. Um, but uh, uh, for instance, like Ogun, Ogun was not in the pro. It's not in the program. Yes, it was when I visited Lagos. Ogun uh, last week that we had a very extensive discussions with the governor, and he realized the importance of this. Now seeing that other states are benefiting. And then he, uh, you know, is, is, uh, committed himself that he's going to, you know, provide all the uh, logistics involved to see that his people are also enrolled. Well, into, into Honourable Minister, so this, area, this area you need to really explain very well because uh, it appears this is where a lot of Nigerians appear to have some misgivings about the first the transparency or the accountability of the payments so far or the distribution, if we can call it so. So you may have to go back a little and tell us, in the last one week or so, how much has been distributed, and to what state, and what were the modalities? So that people will now know that there was really a transparent method of uh, the activity. Well, as at last week, or as at, as at early this week, uh, 25 states uh, of the Federation have been paid. And this is into hundreds of millions uh, of Naira. I cannot really uh, say the exact so amount. So it's, it's going to be less, roughly say 20,000 times. 20,000 times, depending on the number of beneficiaries in that state. Okay. You know, but it's supposed to be 20,000 times uh, uh, one, one million people. 
if we are going to uh, do look it, at the we are entire. Going to the, uh, yes, we okay. are going to we are going to capture the entire people that are on the program. And don't forget, Ogun might join in. We are in the next in the next, in the next uh, uh, payment, payment cycle. Mm. So the, the figures will increase uh, definitely. And uh, for on the purpose of transparency and accountability, I think we've been uh, transparent enough by going out there to, to uh, flag up this program to make sure that the beneficiaries are getting these, these monies uh, as uh, they are supposed to get them. And then uh, it is a process that uh, really uh, involves, uh, is a very tedious process, and we are disbursing cash for now, but the ministry is working on digitalizing this process end to end. But don't also forget the fact that we have some beneficiaries that are in the remotest parts of this uh, country that uh, are not on any banking system and that they, they don't have any uh, mobile uh, telecom. So how do you reach them? So these people, you have to reach them, giving them uh, the cash using the payment service providers uh, as, uh, as, we are, as is obtainable now. But we hope that at least we'll be able to minimize to a very large extent, you know, the, the usage of uh, cash disbursement by the time we're able to digitalize this process end to end. And talking about these payment um, service providers, you terminated a contract of one just some days back, um, and you're also looking at um, the World Bank procurement guidelines. Now, for this World Bank procurement guidelines, would it apply to all states, talking about these payment provide, um, service providers? Well, yes, it is normally the World Bank that does the processes of this uh, procurement because it's a uh, World Bank uh, uh, funded project. But for the, for the purpose of this particular uh, uh, vendor that we terminated uh, uh, the, the contract is because uh, they, have not, they have defaulted. And they should have been in the program since last year. But they're not able to deliver uh, this, this, this service. And we felt it's just very unfair to the beneficiaries to be really deprived, de deprived of their uh, entitlement or of their uh, stipends just because uh, of the fault of, uh, of, the, of the vendor. So we felt we have done everything possible to see that they live up to the agreements of the contract but they, they, they have defaulted and so we were left with no option but to, to terminate uh, that contract. Now we're going back to the, to the World Bank uh, to follow the procurement guidelines but it's not going to be as tedious because we're not starting all over. Already we have some vendors in the program okay. who have the capacity to deliver uh, so we're going to select one of such vendor to now go ahead and, and, and um, provide this um, payment to, the, to these affected states. And these states are, are four. We have uh, Bielsa, uh, Abia, Akwaiba, and Zafara State. And we hope that between now and the 28th of this month, we'll be able to uh, take this payment uh, to these beneficiaries. It's interesting that the Zamfara is your state and they are not being paid. Well, yes, this is uh, where we find ourselves, but uh, it's not about being my state, but it's about uh, seeing to it that every state in the country uh, in, in benefits from this program. Now, why do you think, uh, or rather, recently the leadership of the National Assembly uh, were, had some misgivings about, uh, and then they made demands about the need for reforms. That's the word they use reforms of the modalities or criteria for the distribution of the palliatives for COVID-19. What are their observations? What are you hearing from them? Because they went ahead to even hold a closed door meeting with Mr. President. We'll come to that. But what did they tell you in the closed session they held with you at the National Assembly? Oh, well, uh, Mohammed, you said it's a closed session. <laughs> so it's a closed session is not something that I will discuss, but the, the bottom line is that uh, the National Assembly members are very concerned about the modalities used because as uh, representatives of the people, they feel they are stakeholders, and really they are stakeholders. Uh, they are the people that represent the, the, the people from the grassroots. So whatever is going to these uh, people, they should uh, be involved. Uh, they should be part of it. And they are not in any way saying that uh, we should not um, 
uh, use the criteria that will not jeopardize the, the integrity of the process. Uh, all they are saying is that they need to uh, be uh, carried along uh, because they are the true representatives of the people and most of these are uh, um, palliatives, you know, is uh, geared towards uh, this particular uh, group of uh, people. And so we have had very extensive discussions with them and going forward we are going to look at all these issues and come up with the best way uh, to, uh, you know, address uh, these issues. So let's what, what are your thoughts? Uh, let's remain in this. What are your thoughts with regard to carrying them along? Because you just told us of the need to adopt the United Nations procurement guidelines. And here you have your national legislators wanting to be carried along. How are you going to carry that along and at the same time adhere to the strict rules of uh, procurement and that's, guidelines? That's of the why United I said Nations? that um, carrying them along without jeopardizing the integrity of the process. Uh, there are there, there, there people that represent uh, these constituents. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the process involves community engagement. So when we're going back to these communities, they are representing these people. So they will be part of those uh, uh, people that will be in the, uh, in the, uh, in the identification process, for instance. So it's not that is selecting the beneficiaries. Selecting the beneficiaries. Okay. It's not a one-man squad. It's not one person that will do it. It's, it's a group of people that come together that are respected in that community mm -hmm. to identify which households uh, fall be, um, within the, the, the criteria set out. You know, and every community has its own uh, poverty uh, level. definition mm -hmm. level. You know what is what is poverty in this community might not really mean be the same in, in the other community. So I think uh, we're all stakeholders in this, and uh, the the objective is to reach out uh, to this uh, to these uh, particular groups and. I know that everyone will live up to his own uh, responsibility. You know, I was listening to the radio this morning and someone was saying they're also poor, that why are they not reaching out? So maybe for clarification, when you say criteria, what are the criteria for selecting these people? Uh, that's why I told you, uh, it, it depends on what the community uh, the Define decides as poor. or defines as poor. Okay. Uh, maybe this uh, a community will decide this household really cannot uh, feed three times a week, the, uh, a day, three meals a day. That is maybe poor be, uh, in that community. Or well, they will say, no, in this household, they cannot afford to take uh, their children to school. That is another component of uh, poor and vulnerable and so on and so forth. So it is the community that really will determine uh, what is poor and vulnerable in that community, and we work with that. Okay, so let's look at other palliative measures, food items also, and not just money. Um, NEMA, we may to understand, is supposed to start a distribution of 45,000 tons of metri uh, metric tons of food items to the affected states, Lagos, FCT, and Ogun State, out of the 70,000 metric tons. Um, have that distribution started? Well, yes, it has started. Uh, Mr. President directed that will be given 70,000 metric tons of grains from the Strategic Grains Reserve by the Ministry of Agri. Uh, we have uh, received these uh, grains uh, from the Ministry of Agri. Uh, we are deploying these uh, grains. Uh, as I'm talking to the ones for Lagos have been deployed. Uh, the ones for uh, Ogun have also been deployed. Uh, FCT, uh, we have gotten some, we have some waiting that are coming in from Malaysia. So we have started the process and uh, we have a structure, the, the emergency response plan uh, structure for distribution of these uh, uh, palliatives, food relief. Uh, it's a structure that has the, the national, states and the local government. Every stakeholder is involved in this distribution. We have state SEMAS, we have local government committees, you know, they come together, they identify which location 
to take these uh, uh, palliatives too. And uh, it is it's by a way of fiscal identification and data capturing of the, for, of the poor and vulnerable uh, using the structure of the disaster response plan. This, this has been done. And I must say that uh, the, 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 the strategy used is we take 25% of the population. That is the target by, by, by the population of a state. Of a state, 25%. Mm. It's a food package of um, the grains, 25-25 kg of each to each household. Okay, and the, also the uh, president... Uh, um, no, I think like, there's a need for her to tell us what other things are in that package. Just grains? Uh, or well, what we have in the strategic uh, grains reserve is grains. Uh, sorghum, uh, millet, maize, and gari. No this rice. Is, those is what we have. The rice now is coming from Nigerian Customs Service. That's what I wanted that to ask. That has also been directed and, uh, the, and the, um, the CJ Customs has uh, directed that we we'll be given uh, these items. We are still uh, collecting uh, the, the items and uh, I've already taken uh, the ones for Lagos and Ogun. And one for FCT is to arrive maybe today or tomorrow because we are bringing them from uh, from Lagos, while other states will also follow suit as we receive. Uh, no palm oil or no sugar. No palm oil, no sugar for now. But there's vegetable oil in the package. Okay, and um, from that, the question I wanted to ask, following what you just said, it's supposed to be um, the president gave a directive for 150 cis trucks of rice, and so far, from what um, report says, um, you've collected just 40 trucks. Yeah, have they given you reason why they're not releasing the rice? Well, they are still they are still uh, tallying the figures. They are still collecting from different um, uh, commands or from different. Uh, um, locations. Uh, we the ones we have been given now really is one in Lagos and One. We we're supposed to get 19 trucks from One, but we we're able to get just five as at this morning. And then the ones uh, in Lagos is 40 trucks. I've already deployed 20 now. We have 20 remaining. The ones in One, we took three to Imo and two to to Ebori, they are waiting for one to be uh, completed. Okay. Now, um, there is also the issue of the trader money um, and for artisans, for petty traders that you've already started distributing in Lagos and um, Ogun State, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. Now, would that also extend beyond the lockdown states, that is talking about FCT, Lagos and Ogun State? Will it also extend to other states? Because other state governors are also imposing the lockdown um, restrictions on their states. So would it extend? And, and they have made... If I just can add, they have made comments and demands as to under the governor's forum that is that uh, they are expecting the federal government to do something. Yes, hopefully we will be able to do that. But we are still also waiting for directives in that regards. Okay, so for now it's just Ogun State uh, and for Lagos now State. for the for the trader money and market money Ogun State FCT and uh, and. Uh, Lagos. Lagos, but we are extending to other states because it's already an existing program. Other states are definitely going to benefit from it. But we're just starting with these three states. We still have uh, uh, something in, in the kitty for, for the other states. So for this particular program is go around the states where we have these uh, uh, beneficiaries. But for the food palliative, as I mentioned, on these strategic grains reserves is for these three, three uh, states, while the rise from customs is going to all the states. Honorable oh, Minister, point. your ministry has the mandate of coordinating all humanitarian activities of uh, the federal government and, of course, Nigeria. Uh, we are told that the private sector coalition against COVID-19, uh, the donations have now hit more than 19 billion naira. What exactly are the figures? Is it 19 or more than that? 
And if it is 19, where are we going with such monies? Uh, well, I think uh, what is happening in that uh, private sector is that they are pulling these monies together and then uh, they're going to use these monies to uh, uh, supply or provide the needs uh, of the country, be it medical uh, or, or in palliatives. Uh, so it is a private uh, sector arrangement. Um, I think the chairman of the tax force uh, will be in a better position to really explain how that is uh, happening. But well, you're a member of the tax force. I'm a member of the tax force. Uh, from what uh, we've been briefed is that they're going to handle this uh, intervention themselves by way of we send the, the needs uh, of the country uh, as it relates to this COVID-19 uh, and then do, do, do provide for it. For the do, do you have an idea as to how much has been generated or collected so far? I don't. Now, let's look at uh, another donation, the United Nations Basket Fund that is appropriately called, it's supposed to be assistance from the coalition of uh, the United Nations countries and uh, it's supposed to be for equipment and other palliatives. How far so far in that regard? Uh, well, I think the United Nations had come together also to donate uh, to have a fund at, for Nigeria and uh, just two days ago, the EU, or you know, visited Mr. President. I was in that meeting, and they have uh, also pledged uh, to donate uh, 50 million euros to that basket. So this also is a, a basket that they're going to use the fund to provide for the country for the country's needs, especially in um, medical equipment. Uh, two days ago, we received the first consignment uh, uh, from, I think, China, that is part of this uh, donation of the UN basket. Okay. So that also is coming, uh, so to speak, in kind, so to speak. So not everything is going to come in physical cash? No, no, not even anything. I don't think anybody is going to for these two uh, organizations, the UN and the private sector, they have not brought, uh, they are not bringing anything cash. Okay, Honorable Minister, there is also one area of concern. The children are also on lockdown, and you mentioned um, the homegrown film school feeding program that would extend to their homes. And a new measure you brought up was the voucher door to door. How are you going to achieve that? Uh, well, that is also a, another directive by Mr. President that we should continue the school feeding program, although schools are closed and children are back at, uh, at home. Uh, so on this, we had discussions with the governors uh, through the Nigerian Governors Forum, and we have come up with the modality, and this is the modality that was adopted to give them uh, the dry food ration or take take home ration uh, to these homes where these uh, children come from. We have a structure already that we are working with. We have vendors that provide the, the food raw materials to the cooks that cook the food within the same locality or the same community. We have the school uh, the, the teachers or the school uh, headmaster who is also within that uh, community. So we are using all these structures and ground to identify these households. And then we provide these vouchers. We also have other personnel on ground, especially the uh, community service uh, development personnel in, in the, all the communities. We're using them in the distribution of, this, uh, of these vouchers. We are using the night post also to, to get these uh, vouchers are printed and also their personnel on ground uh, to see that we distribute these vouchers and then we have designated distribution uh, centers within the communities that these members of the household will go and present and pick this food ration.
to to their to their to their homes, and we 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 believe that in every home we will have at least uh, three children in that home. So the package is going to you know really take into consideration the number of the uh, of the children in that in that house. When, when is that uh, beginning? Uh, hopefully by next week we should start that. Is it going to be strictly children who attend, <coughs> excuse me, public schools in their communities, or will it extend to other vulnerable homes? Well, in every home where you have a child that goes to, to, to school, he will have his siblings or her siblings in that home, so they will also be taken care of. For the purpose of this homegrown school feeding, there are other palliatives that are going to the poor and vulnerable households. Yes. For example, the cash transfer also the food distribution uh, that we are doing. These households are going to be identified and they also get that. Okay, let's look at the IDPs in the North East. What are the plans put in place? Uh, the IDPs have been very well uh, taken care of. From the beginning of this uh, lockdown, we have uh, taken two months uh, food ration to the IDP camps, the official IDP camps uh, in the Northeast especially. And for the other IDP camps, we have also taken uh, some uh, this, this uh, relief. The ones in FCT, we are in the process because we are waiting for the last uh, uh, deployment of the grains to start. We did, but we've gone to the camps, we have sensitized them, we have taken uh, since uh, these uh, sanitization, sanitization, hygiene, yeah. hygiene uh, items to, the, to these camps, and we have their numbers. We are working with the FCT authority. We know the number of camps that we have within the FCT, and also other states uh, where we have uh, these camps. Most of these uh, displaced uh, uh, populations they live within the host communities. It's not in every state that you have, like in my state, for example, Zafar State. We do not have an official camp in the state, but we have people that are displaced, but they live within the host communities. Uh, all these interventions in these lockdown states where we have IDPs, uh, we're taking these interventions. But for the other IDPs that are officially uh, recognized in their camps, it's, it's a routine thing. Every month they are provided this uh, food ration uh, to them, each household within the camp is being given this uh, food ration. But for the purpose of this uh, COVID-19, Mr. President, Director Dua, we give them two months, you know, and that has been done. Now let's look at uh, the issue of the Government Enterprise Power Program, and of course the NPower. Uh, <coughs> since you are here, I think it will be nice to, to use this opportunity to also speak to these uh, programs that are under your ministry. Uh, well, the Government Empowerment and Enterprise Program, GIP, that is one that we just spoke about, the trader money, market money, and the farmer money is an existing program, and uh, we have expanded. Uh, you know, that was what I flagged off in Lagos and, and Ogun for the lockdown states and uh, FCT. But it's an existing program, and in that program, Mr. President also directed that we give a three months moratorium to this to this to this uh, beneficiaries that has already been done we have not fight them and then we have expanded so that has been taken care of for the empower uh, the, the empower program is a program for the uh, graduates youth as we are aware uh, that have been enrolled into the program since 2000 and some 2016, while others uh, were enrolled in 2018, uh, the first batch of the, uh, the Empire beneficiaries were the ones that were uh, enrolled in 2016, 200,000 of them, and 2018 we enrolled 300,000. We give them monthly uh, stipends of 30,000 naira, and they are mainly end teach, they, they teach public schools uh, across the country. Uh, we, we are faced with some challenges of uh, payment because uh, uh, paying 500,000 uh, uh, people from public funds has to go through uh, processes, financial rules and regulations, and then procedures. And this is what we do every month. Uh, so, uh, if I told there's any delay, it's not uh, on purpose. It's just for us to make sure that no beneficiary 
is omitted and at the same time no ghost uh, beneficiary also is paid so this is a normal routine processes that we must uh, go through for the for the purpose of transparency and accountability and even prudence and we all know that uh, mr president is very very uh, particular about these uh, three aspects of of, of uh, managing public funds so this is what we do i know that it, it, it came to my table the normal procedure is to ask the accounting officer to advise. It comes back. Before you advise you, he will also push it out. So it's, it's a process. So what, was that what was responsible for the initial that, delay that, in payment? That, that, uh, it will continue to be like that. Let me say it here. It will continue to be like that. We there's, must, there's going to be continuous are, delay? It is going to be through these processes. So if somewhere along the line we get delays, it's not on purpose. It's just that it's going through processes and procedures of government. That is one. And, and it is also very important for us to understand that uh, these beneficiaries uh, on this program is not a permanent thing. We are also working uh, day and night to see how we exit these beneficiaries uh, to put them into uh, some kind of uh, permanent job, so to speak. So it's, it's a process we're undergoing, we're going through day in, day out to see that uh, everyone uh, is better off for it at well, the end of the day. Don't you think for the sake of the uh, Empower beneficiaries, the government should come up with a foolproof procedure that will be hitch free and not cause any delay in the future. Because this is a program you have done in the last two, this, three years. This is, this is the hitch free, uh, uh, Mohammed. Uh, it's a program that people have been on for years. But at the same time, we can't say that the same number of people that have enrolled into this program are still in this program. Some might have gotten their, their permanent jobs and have moved on. Something might have happened to some of them, maybe. But are they still they, collecting they, 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 the stipends? These are things where always, every month, you have to go through this process and procedure to make sure that we fish out those that are not on the program, so that we don't. That's why I said so that we don't pay ghost, 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 ghost beneficiaries. But you're also and at the same time, so that we don't omit those those, those others that are still on the program. So what, what are you going to come up with? Because I know you're working towards overhauling the process. So what would you recommend? Well, we're we are still in the process of overhauling one to strengthen the, the base, to expand the base as well, to also make sure that these people that are on the program, they exit on something to fall back on. Um. These are all the processes. We are also working on expanding and even uh, doubling the beneficiaries. We're also working on making sure that other beneficiaries come on board so that they, they, they are not, uh, you know, uh, um, marginalized or they are not, because there are people in the queue waiting. Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 I think there's a need for you to, uh, let's, you have touched uh, substantially on the issue of the reforms mm. of the conditional cash, cash transfer. Maybe you, let's look at holistically the need for reforms of the various programs, both the CCT, the NPOWER, the Government Enterprise Empowerment Program, and... The, this uh, is all what we are working on. All the SIPs programs, we are looking at how we are going to reform them or to, to improve on what we have, to build on the existing uh, ones. This is what the ministry is, is working on. Don't forget that these programs came to the ministry uh, late uh, October. And we started being debriefed by November, where in March. So it's a whole lot of process. It's a process that took two years to be in, uh, on, uh, on ground or to be in place. So you don't expect us that within three months or four months to, to finish the, the overhaul or the reorganizing of the, of the process. What, the, the what's your, time, like, what's really your target? To, to, is intended to improve. Yeah, what's, uh, what is your target? Uh, well, we hope that what by, target are you giving we, yourself? We hope that by July, mm -hmm. we'll be able to come up with, 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 our, with, our, with our, our changes. Without the lockdown, though? Even with the lockdown. Okay. Well, the ministry, you are minister of humanitarian affairs, disaster management, and social development. Let's look at some aspect of disasters. Of recent, we have recorded 
issues of fire di disasters, fire occurrences of some uh, very strategic institutions. Does it worry you? Of course it does. And one of the mandate of the ministry is to ensure strategic disaster mitigation, preparedness and response. And this is what also we've been doing and we're trying to improve on what we have on ground. And I must say that most of the disasters that happen in this country really uh, uh, are born out of uh, uh, some kind of negligence, so to speak, be it uh, flooding, uh, be it even the fire disasters. So we're, 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 we're carrying out a massive sensitization program across the country on, on the dangers of this negligence, uh, you know, on the, on, on the, on the dangers of uh, what this uh, could cause, uh, losing lives and properties. So that is also uh, in the pipeline to see that we're able to reduce uh, the number of, uh, of, of disasters happening across the country. If you say substantially some, most of them are based on negligence, is there any mechanism whereby you will really penalize and, uh, if you like, punish persons found wanting to have caused or this negligence? Honestly, we are left with no any other option than that. We have to enforce, you know, uh, these these measures. Uh, once uh, one is, is found wanting or is, is, is found to be uh, really guilty, we should we should enforce the measures that are there, you know, so that we deter others from doing that and we will save lives and properties in the in, in the course of doing that. Honourable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Hajia Saadia Omar Farouk, thank you so much for finding time to come to our studio to discuss this very special edition that uh, uh, focused on the challenges your ministry is facing in distributing palliatives for COVID-19 and generally uh, actualizing and implementing your mandate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Ruth Aguilar. As usual, thank you so thank much you for much. being there and supporting the program at the same time. In the past 50 minutes, Honorable Minister for Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Haji Asadia Omar Farouk, responded to questions on platform, particularly on the federal government's desire and commitment to ameliorating the plight of the less privileged, the poor and the vulnerable persons as Nigeria tackles the scourge of coronavirus. That's platform. I am Muhammad Kudaw Bakar. Bye for now.